نحمده نستعينه نستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونظيرا بين يدي الساء ما يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون وقال عز وجل هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وقال عز وجل إذا جاءك المنافقون قالوا نشهد إنك لرسول الله والله يعلم إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين لكاذبون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأخدة من لساني يفتح قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارتقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارتقنا اجتنابا اللهم ألحمني رشدي وعزني من شر نفسي آمين يا رب As you know in the last two Jumas we were going over the links between Sudh al-Saf and Sudh al-Jum'ah and today I'm going to try to connect everything and particularly in reference to how it relates to Sutul Munafiqun. Just to summarize, Sutul Saf starts with the very point that Sutul Munafiqun addresses. Ya amanu lima ma la Oh, you people who believe, why do you say that which you don't do? And then from there, the discourse of the main theme of the Saf starts, which is, don't be like the people who were with Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said to them, لِمَا تُؤْذُونَنِي Why are you giving me pain? قَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ You know I'm a messenger to Allah from you. Why are you giving me pain? When people in your own ranks are not steadfast, and for this, because the Prophet was sent, why? This is an important... What was the purpose of the advent of the Prophet ﷺ, according to the Qur'an? This ayah has been repeated in the Qur'an three times. Surah Tawbah, Surah Al-Fatih, Surah Al-Saf. Two times in exactly the same words. What was his purpose of coming? And that is... It is Allah who sent His Messenger and Deen al Haq. Deen you can translate as a social system, as a social reality. Is this better? Bismillah. Bismillah. Okay. Bismillah. Can you hear now? Okay. So, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq li yudhirahu ala al-deen kulli. Allah sent His Messenger. Why? With Al-Huda, the guidance. Mankind needs guidance. Now this is a bigger discussion. What does the a guidance entail? But he sent mankind for guidance. And Deen al haq And that way of life, that system under which people can live within that is haq, that is just. لِيُذْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ So he will make his messenger supreme or dominated over all other ways of life. This has been repeated in the Quran three times. Now when the messenger comes with his call, obviously people oppose this. 
and the Prophet has come with a call and people have to respond to this on the other side. <coughs> now if you agree with the call of the Messenger and you want to do something for Islam, you believe in the Prophet, the next thing that has to happen is, okay, we have to get organized. And the beginning of Sutu Saf and the ending of Sutu Saf is about being organized. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفًّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْصُوصٌ Indeed, Allah loves those who struggle in His path as if they are a solid wall. And then, the ending. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُونُوا أَنصَارُ اللَّهِ All you people believe, become helpers of Allah. كَمَا قَالَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ Like Jesus said to His disciples, he said to his disciples, who will help me in the cause of Allah? The disciples, they said, we will help you in the cause of Allah. So a man stands up, he makes a call, people join him. This is the beginning of an organization. And the purpose is, they become like a solid wall. A community is not mature unless it is organized like a solid wall. Muslims in America, we're new here. We're still going through and still figuring things out. We still have a lot of growing to do as a community. But the purpose of Sutu Saf is, are you going to or are you not going to commit yourself to the cause of Allah? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Oh, you people who believe, should I tell you of a bargain that will save you from the hellfire? تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنْفُسِكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ قَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Then really do believe. And if you believe, it will manifest where your wealth goes, where your time goes, where you spend your time. ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ وَجَاهِدُ آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Believe, really believe. And then spend yourself for the cause. This is better for you if you did that. This was the theme of Sutul Saf. That's Sutul Jum'ah. Now the question is, okay, I have a call to make. I want to help Islam. I want to help get organized. But how can I train the people? How can I discipline the people? How can I organize the people? How can I give them the right morals and ethics so that they can function properly within this movement? The answer of that comes in the next surah, Surah Jum'ah. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُذْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ وَلَوْ كَرِحًا هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَسَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَطْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ it is Allah who sent His Messenger. He will do four things with Qur'an. Now this Qur'an, you have the people with you, you recite to them, you purify them, you teach them the law. This is allowed, this is not allowed. This is the right way, this is not the right, wrong, this is not the right way. And you give them the wisdom. So you organize them. You organize them, you give them tarbiyah, you purify them, you give them the ethics, you give them the ikhlaq, you give them the manners, you give them the adab. How will you do this? By the Qur'an. At the same time, over there, Sutu Saf said, Oh, you people who believe, why do you say that which you don't do? Over here, the example is given of the people before. They were given the Torah, and they didn't carry the responsibility. They said, we will, qalu sami'na. They said, we will listen and obey, but they didn't. And so the Jum'ah ends with why this institute of Jum'ah is instituted. وَإِذَا نُوذِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْأَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ الْأَلْهِ Dhikr here is Qur'an. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِرِ Al-Dhikr, the remembrance is Qur'an. The reminder is Qur'an. So, the institute of Jum'ah was established to give them the ayat, to give them the wisdom, give them the knowledge of the book and the wisdom of the book. So that they will be able to function as a community. So that they will be organized. The lessons in Quran, they will give them great wisdom. This is the relationship between Sutul Saf and Sutul Jum'ah. Are you going to 
commit yourself to the cause of Islam, then do so. Now, the opposite of this is the people who intentionally or unintentionally who become barriers to the cause of Islam, either within themselves or externally. And these are, in the Quranic terminology, called munafiqun, hypocrites. And this is actually, just uh, one thing I want to mention, the miracle in Surah Saf, just a miraculous aspect of each of the surahs, because there's many, but one that I really like to share with, is it's just very recent, like literally within six years, seven years ago, the first book came out on this subject, which was about James, the brother of Jesus. So the stuff ends with, when Jesus made this call, من أنصار إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله The disciples, they said, we will join hands with you. So Allah says, فَآمَنَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِلَ وَكَفَرَ الطَّائِفَةُ A group of them believed and a group of them rejected. فَأَيَّدْنَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَىٰ أَدُوِّهِمْ فَأَصْبَهُ ظَاهِرِينَ And those people that responded to the call of Jesus, they became supreme. So where in the history is it that people that called to the, that responded to the call of Jesus and they became victorious? This actually happened in the hands of who is known as James, historically, after Isa alayhi passed away, the disciple of Jesus, the person who led the movement of, of the prophets, because as you know, Zakaria was killed by the Roman Empire, then Yahya was killed, then they tried to kill Isa alayhi and then they also finally killed James. But James had been successful to establish a government in Jerusalem for almost 70 years. The, fall, the second fall of the Temple of the Jews happened in 70 AD, 70 years after Jesus, peace be upon him, and in that also just like they had killed Zakaria and Yahya, and they had tried to kill Isa they also killed James, and from there the movement had dissipated. I'm not going to go into the history of that, but there is a 500-page book written by one of the, I forget his name right now, he's written a whole book, and many other people have written about this now, that this was the, the, the establishment of Islam, or the Sharia, or Islamic law, where the laws of Torah were being applied at the time of, uh, even after the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, the Jum'ah, like I said, the miracle there is, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعْسَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ So the Sutu Saf is that Allah says this point that we didn't know till really the details till recently. That the people that responded to the call of Jesus, because you hear that Jesus was raised, they were trying to kill him, so the idea is that we feel that, oh, maybe the movement wasn't successful. But actually, the movement was successful uh, when, you, when you actually look at, at the history that, as we know it today. And the second point is, in Surah Al-Jum'ah, the miracle is, Allah says, وَالَّذِي بَعْصَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ Allah has raised a messenger amongst the Ummiyin, meaning the Arabs. And then Allah says, وَآخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ And the non-Arabs who have not yet joined them, but they will be joining them very soon. وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمُ This is the bounty of Allah. He gives it without asking to whoever He likes. <coughs> so that's the miracle of Sutta Saf, a historical point. And the prophecy that was given in Sutta Al-Jum'ah that this will go way beyond the borders of the Arab world and beyond وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيم so, so the Jum'ah ends with, by the way, a situation Allah says, okay, now in order to learn Qur'an, there's this institute of Jum'ah to propagate Qur'an. But then the people in the time of the Prophet, by the way, the Prophet, when he first started Jum'ah, it used to be the opposite way, the way we do it in Eid. They used to pray first and then give the khutbah. But they used to, after praying, they were listening to the khutbah, but there would be some caravans or some trade going on, and people would leave the lecture of the Prophet and go to the business and leave the Prophet ﷺ. They would leave the Prophet standing, and some of them would just dissipate. This was disliked, so the Prophet changed it later on, where he gave the khutbah first, and then he gave the lecture. But the point being here, again, how this connects with Sutul Munafiqun, 
Because this behavior, this behavior of leaving the Prophet's majlis, his, his attendance, and going for business, was a sign of, was the beginning of the signs of weakness in Iman, which is towards munafiqeen. And to the Saf, like I said, it starts with, Ya yuhilladina amanu lima taquluna ma la tafalun. And so, Sutul so Saf is the mission, Sutul so Jum'ah is the way of training them, and then Sutul so Munafiqun is talking about what are the things that will cause problems for you. What is being a Munafiq? By the way, I want to uh, explain this um, also from a different perspective. You know, uh, <coughs> hypoc hypocrisy was for the first time in psychology properly understood or experimented with in 1994, studies of Habak, what does it mean to be a hypocrite? And it's amazing that, you know, on the one side, Allah is saying, commit to this cause. And then in the next surah, Allah is saying, look, hold on to the Quran, get close to the Quran, you'll get trained and have the proper ethics to be properly organized. And in the very next surah, Allah is telling us that internal situation, being a hypocrite, how it comes out. You know, when uh, in, in medicine, Whenever there is a disease, right? You have the disease, you have the cause of the disease, right? What causes it? You have the symptoms of the disease, what are the symptoms of the disease? Right? You have the prognosis of the disease, that if you don't cure this disease, what will problems it will lead to? You have the treatment of the disease, and treatment is of two types, preventive and curative. Preventive, to not let the disease happen. Curative, if you have it, how you're going to make the disease go away. Right? And, um, and then sometimes for a disease, there's also the different stages. It's stage one, stage two, stage three. In the same way, Sutul Munafiqun, exactly like this, exactly like this. It gives you the cause, the symptoms, the stages, the prognosis, the cure, the preventive cure, the, the, the preventive cure, the, uh, the, 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 the preventive cure as well as the curative treatment to make the disease go away. Now, today, I'm only going to touch upon some aspects of Sutul Munafiqun, but I want you to understand this connection. It starts with, oh, you people who believe, are you going to commit to Islam? Okay, if you want to commit to Islam, to be strong, hold on to the Qur'an. That's Sutul Jum'ah. And now, know what it means to be a hypocrite. When you believe in something, but you can't act upon what you're believing. It's, in psychology, we call it cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissidence studies, by the way, have happened since 1950s. They've studied cognitive dis dissidence. But this first time actually studying hypocrisy and how it works started from 1994. I mean, they studied cognitive dissidence from 1950s. For example, just a quick example, and time is running out. A quick example is, I believe smoking is bad, but I smoke. Right? So there's a conflict, internal conflict. And you know the word munafid, nafaqa, comes from the Arabic word, uh, the, 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 uh, the etymology of the word, one of its uh, roots is, there was a lizard in the desert. There was a lizard in the desert, it would create holes in the desert. And so if it went in one, it would come out the other. And went in the other, come out the other. Okay, so this is nafaqa, nafaq. Munafiq is a person who has, who acts like this. He, he doesn't stick to one thing. He is... Sometimes here, la ha'ulai wa la ha'ula. They're nor here nor there. And this happens consciously as well as subconsciously. This is also very important to know. There are people that are munafiq, they are, Allah says about them, qad bil kufr. They entered Islam in kufr. They entered, they said, anybody who takes six, the shah. This is a very important concept to understand, by the way. Uh, very, very important to understand what I'm about to explain right now. Because the, 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 the significance of Sutul Munafiqun will not be understood without understanding this. Anyone who takes the Shahada becomes Muslim. He's legally Muslim. But somebody can be a spy and takes the Shahada, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He has legally become Muslim. He has legally, yani in Qanun, in terms of Qanun, he is Muslim. He is Muslim. He's taken the shahada. But in his heart, he never accepted Islam for one day. Example of that in the time of the Prophet وسلم, Abdullah bin Ubay. Abdullah bin Ubay, Raisul Munafiqeen, he was, you know, the Aus and the Khazraj had been fighting each other for a long time. There were 
two tribes in Medina. And they had agreed, okay, look, we've been fighting for so long. Let's just choose a king. He will be our king. Let's choose one king so we're not fighting each other. So they were about to make Abdullah bin Ubay their king. They were about to make this person their king. But what happened is, during the process of this, so many of the people, they had become Muslim. And so that all, you know, what he was maybe fantasizing and daydreaming and I would be the king and so on and so forth. Now, so many had become Muslim of the Aws and the Khazraj. They invited the Prophet. The Prophet became the crownless king of Medina. And Ubay, uh, Ubay, uh, Abdullah bin Ubay, he's left as he has no authority now. Right? So he felt, he, he felt, okay, the only way I can have authority now is if I become a Muslim. Okay? And there's a story about him, I mean, again, I don't have too much time, but I'll share this with you. You know, Abdullah bin Ubay is one of those people that in order to, you know, make himself, again, this is the role of the munafiq, right? In order to make himself feel somewhat, I still have some power. Whenever the Prophet would stand up for Jummah, he would be like, okay, people, shh, the Prophet's about to talk. Okay? And behind the Prophet's back, he was doing all sorts of things. And then one day when his uh, makr, his plotting and planning became known to the Prophet, uh, this is after some time, you know, the Prophet told him, you're not in a position to do this anymore, so just stay. Because Abu Bakr is sitting, you know, Umar is sitting, he's not telling the others, sit down, sit down. But in order for him to feel some sort of glory of what he, he was thinking he had lost, he was used to do this. But anyway, the pro point I'm trying to make is that Studies in hypocrisy, they show, this is a positive aspect of hypocrisy. And I want the kids to know this, the, that hypocrisy is very good if you're aware of your hypocrisy. And the Prophet actually said it best. The Prophet said, whoever, man khafa, whoever fears hypocrisy has iman. And whoever doesn't fear hypocrisy for him, he, you know, he does something wrong, you feel bad, it's like a fly and you just make it, like, shoo away the fly, you don't feel bad, it doesn't disturb you. It's like a fly comes to you, you make it go away, and then that's it, you move on in your life. But a person who feels the difference in his attitude between wh what he believes and what he is, when he feels that gap becoming bigger, you should realize as young kids, that's your body talking to you. That's your own body talking to you that something is wrong. You're doing, you know, when you say to yourself, I'm doing something that I don't believe, right? I'm watching something I don't believe I should be watching. Or I'm participating in something I don't believe I should be participating. That is your own soul, your own body, your own biology telling you, hey, something is wrong here, you need to fix this. And I'll share with you one thing that, um, very quickly, uh, this book that just came out in the study of hypocrisy, it says, uh, psychologists argue that cognitive consistency is a basic principle of how we function. Meaning, to, to, what we say and what we do has to be one. If we don't, then what happens? If we seek to resolve any form of dissidence, until we do, we feel tension of hypocrisy. Dissidence between two cognitions or two attitudes, an attitude and behavior, particularly those that are important to us, lead us to uncomfortable feelings. When you have that uncomfortable feeling that I'm not doing what I know I should do, that's yourself telling you, wait, you need to fix this. You need to make this right. Anyway, <coughs> uh, please come forward. Uh, in my second khutbah, I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms and how this, um, this disease actually grows at the subconscious level. One is Abdullah bin Ubay, he did it consciously. Those people that when the Prophet was coming back from Ta'if and they hid uh, in, the, in the mountain to, to push the Prophet, to kill the Prophet, they did it on purpose. They, they knew that they are not really believers, but they had the, the, uh, the, cloth, the cloth of being believers. So there are a few things I want to make clear in the second khutbah. Inshallah, Now, one thing that I want to be very clear about is that some people make this mistake in their understanding of Islam and I just want it to be very clear. It is not like you are mu'min 
and then there's munafiq. There's a third category. You're mu'min if your iman is musbat in the positive side. You really do believe, but you may be weak. And that goes positive one, positive two, all the way infinite. Infinite on one side is Abu Bakr, for example. Munafiq, you know you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, all the way going negative, infinite. Abdullah bin Ubay on the other side. But there's a zero where it is nor negative nor positive. You may have, you may accept Islam because your parents are Muslim. Or you may have accepted Islam because it seemed like the right thing to do, but when the challenges you were faced with made you step back. And this is what happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. A lot of people, they heard Prophet Muhammad's message. Oh, it sounds good. It sounds good. Oh, but I have to give my money? I have to struggle in the path? Oh, th this is now. I, I knew what he was saying is good, but why do we have to do this? So, majority of the Muslims of today, they do not fall in the category of being a munafiq. Actually, our problem is doubt. Our real problem as Muslims is doubt. Please come forward. We are like the people mentioned in Surah Hujrat. The desert Bedouins who came to Islam later. And also, Bedouins are mentioned because generally used to be considered, and once the Sheikh said this comment to me, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Bedouins and were considered people that didn't have more civilized behavior. And the people in the city were considered that they have more civilized behavior. Today, nowadays, it's the opposite. This is what the Sheikh said. I don't know one way or the other, but the Sheikh said nowadays the people in the cities, they have bad behavior, and the people in the villages, they have better behavior than the people in the city. Allahu Akbar. But anyway, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ amanna. The desert Bedouins, they say we believe. Allah says, O oh Muhammad, tell them, Lam tu'minu, you don't believe. You don't have iman. Real faith is not there. But say, we have accepted Islam. Lamma yadkhulul imana fi qulubikum. Iman has not entered your hearts right now. Conviction is not there. That thing that Allah is asking in Surah al Saf, that you commit yourself to Islam, that's not there. Because if you're really committed to Islam, then you're going to be really be willing to give your wealth and your time and effort and everything to Islam. But if you're not committed to Islam, then you have to ask yourself, hey, what's come, what, are the, what are the symptoms? Now, I'm going to only talk about the first ayah in this regard. And that is, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When the munafiqeen, they come to you Those, and the people that are being referred to in this surah, by the way Are the people that are not, they're not, they're not munafiq uh, sh in sha'ur They don't read, they don't, they have the problem of being munafiq within themselves They don't even realize that they're munafiq In other words, they're not like Abdullah bin Ubay They're not outwardly trying to oppose Islam But what happens is what does Sutta Saf say? Become organized. Listen to what I'm about to say. Sutta Saf says, become organized. Quran was revealed and says, okay, do this. Act upon these injunctions. The two surahs before. Sutta Saf and Sutta Jum'ah. But then you're asked, why didn't you come to the meeting? Why didn't you go to the Battle of Tabuk? Then you start lying. And this is why the Prophet said, and the Quran also, in two places, same thing here. Allah bears witness that they're lying. Because and what happens? Why didn't you come to the meeting? Why didn't you give to this cause? Because then you start. The first problem happens with the Prophet and his companions. With the cause. You don't want to... I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody knocks on your door for Fajr. Right? You, you open the door. And you feel like, okay, you know, I have to go. I mean, there's a group of brothers. I'll go, Fajr. Okay, I'll go. 
Second day they knock, okay, you go. Third day you go. Fourth day you start making excuses. Oh, brother, you know, I have to go to my workplace. You know, I just can't uh, get it. And then what happens? The people who are knocking on the door, whether they're doing right or wrong, this is not the issue. I'm just giving an example. The people that are knocking on the door, then you start having ill feelings towards them. Oh, you know, who do they think they are? And then you hear something bad happens to them, you feel good. Oh, yeah, that brother that used to knock on my door, now he can't come because he's in the hospital. Please move forward. Move, move forward. These are the different stages of being a munafiq. So the first stage is you start lying and making excuses. The second stage is aymanahum jannatun. They take their oaths. They say, Wallah, you know, O oh Prophet of Allah, I really meant to do this, but this happened. Like when the Battle of Tabuk was going to happen, one of the people said, Oh, you know, I would love to go to jihad, but the women there are so beautiful that I don't think I should go. They take, they make their oaths as a way to shield themselves because they want to prove that they're with the believers. So, Sutu so Saf, commit yourself to Islam. How are you going to make sure you're committed to Islam? Glue yourself to the Quran. Then, one of the symptoms is you start lying. Why weren't you at the meeting? Why were you late? Why are you not really participating in, in the cause of Islam? Why are you not participating in Islamic institutions? Why are you not participating in the Islamic cause? Then the excuses, they come. So you have to, now, this is for the kids. Please come forward. Please come forward. Everybody come forward. We don't have time anymore. Come on. Please come forward. Everybody move forward, please. Anyway, it's time to end. But this is the first ayah of Surah Al-Munafiqun, which I want to think about the geniusness of Qur'an here. That it says, commit to Islam first. And then it gives you the tools to purify yourself so you will be committed to Islam by the Qur'an. And then it tells you the symptoms and the causes and how to cure the disease of not being a munafiq. I mean, think about this. We just studied hypocrisy in psychology just less than 10, 20 years ago. And the Qur'an is discussing in detail. Allah, you know, one of the, one of the things that we know about uh, being uh, hypocritical about something is to be lazy to do. One is you're not doing it, but the other is you do it, but you do it lazy. Allah says, لا يقومون إلا, إلا كسال. لا يقومون, it, They don't stand up for prayer إلا كسال, except that they're lazy. Allah mentions this. Something that we know in research only a few years ago. And it's amazing. But you look at this. Go home and study. Sutu Saf, Sutul Jumu'ah. And then the first few ayat of Surah Munafiqun, I mean the whole surah, really. But this is, you know, and these are the people who entered Islam. Those were, the, Abdullah bin Ubayyaz entered it, قَدْ دَخَلُوا بِالْكُفْرِ They entered is, is, is Islam with kufr. But these are the people here mentioned, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ كَفَرُوا They accepted Islam, truly. But then things happened. They couldn't keep up with the others and they just, they, then they started abhorring the others. And that's like one of the symptoms. And then the cure, we will inshallah discuss this in the next uh, few sessions maybe. But I wanted you to appreciate this. Go home and study Sutul Saf, Sutul Jumu'ah, Sutul Munafiqun. And ask yourself, where am I? Am I, am I a Munafiqun? You know, uh, just I want to end with this because it's important. The Sahib al-Sirrul Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The man who kept the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the companions knew he had the list of all the Munafiqun. It was... It was uh, 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 Hudayfah He was known as Sahib al-Sibr al-Nabi He had all Umar radiallahu Who was He's Umar He went to, to Hudayfah radiallahu And he said Swear by Allah That I'm not in that list That maybe I'm doing this For other reasons We never know I mean Never know for sure Why I'm doing something In the deep end Right I mean you never know If you're doing it for Allah Or you're doing it for fame Or you're doing it for You never know and so Omar was so worried. So we have to all ask ourselves, and especially the youth, when you yourself, see yourself, you believe in something, but you're acting contrary to what you believe in, you have to really step back and say, okay, why? Why am I doing this? Do I have doubts? What's my problem? And inshallah, I'll end there. أستغفر الله
ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكن من الخاسرين اللهم تجعل خلافة المسلمين في هذه الارض اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد there's a brother Saleh who's passed away اللهم اغفر وارحمه there will be announcements after Jumu'ah please listen to the announcements they're very very important uh, إن الله يعملكم بالأذن والإحسان وإنتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون واذكروا الله يذكركم فاسألوا لكم فأقيموا الصلاة